this public, public meeting to order for May 20th, 2020. Getting some pretty gnarly echo there. Is anybody going to turn their mute off? Okay, before we dive in, we'd like to acknowledge that uh, Missoula Co County acknowledges that this event takes place on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Cowspell people. Next thing we will do is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I think Emmy had at some point a, a flag for us. There we go. Let us pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have any public announcements? Any, any public comment not on the agenda? All right. Hey, our hey Josh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if uh, I don't know if she's even on the line here, but I think it's worth noting at this meeting that uh, this week is Vicki Zyers' last week with Missoula County after uh, 35 years in a variety of roles. She wraps up this week her career as uh, our chief administrative officer and uh, and just a big thank you to Vicki for her decades of service. Absolutely. If I, if I understand it right, 35 years of service and finishing up as the county's top employee with years in multiple positions. Yeah. Thank you so much to Vicki. It's going to make me cry. Good. Yeah. They don't yeah, she's so good at her work and such a good human and a good model for all of us in terms of how we should comport ourselves as public officials. That was a good one. Thanks, Absolutely. Dave. For that. Yeah. All right, our, our current claims received as of April 30th through May 20th, 2020 by the commissioner's office, total $4,535,249.19. And if you're curious on how that money was spent, you could find out on our website. Today we have three public hearings and the first one concerns the Pine Drive. And I believe that uh, Jean Curtis, who works for the sewer district in Sealy and Steve Nide, our surveyor, will present. Good afternoon, commissioners. It's Jean Curtis, district manager for the Sealy Lake Sewer. So we will go down in history maybe as the longest running for one simple <laughs> easement with the most complicated history. Um, so currently I'm uh, still waiting for information from, um, for an, like an internal transfer from the one family to the other. Um, but I did talk with John Hart this week about the process and I, I notified um, the owners that they pro it's probably because I thought well maybe it's more complicated than doing the normal quit quit there's all these different words quit claim um, transfer of property and John said that in reality they probably could just do it through um, if they through that quiet title action if the other half of the ownership. So remember there's two ladies um, related to the one gentleman and three from the other side. Then the three ladies have decided they just they just don't even want to be involved in this inheritance. It just doesn't seem worth their time. So if if the the fa the Sayer family heirs go to court with the quiet title action to prove their ownership and notify the other the Steinburner family and they don't protest, um, then it would be transferred and, and it's actually um, a stronger case to, for ownership if the court says yes you do own it. So I've notified them of that and hopefully they'll let their attorney know. And But unfortunately I need to ask you to continue the hearing another month. 
<laughs> we can do that. <laughs> is, that is that a motion one? <laughs> I, I move to continue the hearing for another month. <laughs> can, can we just do it? So I, what I don't know. Date date? Uh, the, what date is that? Um, the 18th? The 25th of June? That would be fine. 25th of June. Okay. Is that right, Emmy? I, yeah, that works. That'll be a budget meeting, just so you know. But I don't think that there's any other items on that. So we could do, um, we could do then, or we could do July 2nd, the first one after that. Do, do you think that will give folks enough time or do we want to kick this into July? Why don't we kick it to July? <laughs> so what did you say that was, July 2nd? Yep. Okay. Okay, so I... So, so the good I news, commissioners, <laughs> is that the lawsuit against the district was thrown out by the district court last week. So hopefully that means we will actually get to go to bid. But you know how this um, project seems to have lots of rabbit trails. Yeah, rumor has it you might have gotten a couple new board members up there, so I guess we'll see how that works. Yes, we did. All right, so we have a we have a motion. Okay, motion to July second. Is that? Oh, do we do we even need a motion? Can we just need a motion? Okay, we'll just move it to July second. We don't need a motion. July. Or okay. Thank you. We started this project July 11th last year, so we would be <laughs> under the year if we could get there. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Amazing. Okay, we'll extend this uh, till July 2nd, and uh, our next hearing is on a resolution to adopt our Climate Ready Missoula plan, and uh, Diana Minetta is here to chat with us. Thank you, commissioners. Um, so just as some quick background, um, as you know, the Board of County Commissioners held a joint public hearing with the Missoula City Council on the Climate Ready Missoula plan on May 11th, um, continued that hearing on May 18th, and on that date, the BCC adopted a resolution of intent to adopt the Climate Ready Missoula Plan as an issue plan of the Missoula County Growth Policy. For the county, the adoption of that resolution of intent is the formal adoption step, um, but there is a final step in the process um, to adopt a growth policy amendment, and that is the resolution to adopt that you have before you today. Um, and that really, uh, you've heard lots of presentations, received a ton of public comment, on this plan, um, that really concludes uh, the comments I was planning to make today, unless there are any questions. Let's do this. Yeah, do we do we have uh, <laughs> do any questions from the commissioners? No questions, but I'll just say again, thanks to, uh, to you, Diana, thanks to um, Amy Sillenberg and uh, Chase uh, Jones with the city of Missoula for all of the uh, fantastic work and getting us to this point. This is uh, this is a good piece of work. Any public comments, Bruce or Jerry? Do you need to? Are you here to chat on this at all? Okay. No, but I I will. Um, this is Jerry. I'll actually really say that I really applaud the efforts of the city and county to work cohesively on this project. It's really um, been nice and thank you for coming to the community councils and spending time with us and explaining it in detail and letting us be a part of it. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to have input and opportunity to learn more about the project. So thank you. Great. Yeah, this has been more than a well more than a year in the making with tons of input from a super active steering committee, lots of public process, really a emblematic project of how you move something forward with the public and something that really is moving us forward regardless of pandemic or not. We need to address this other burning fire uh, that is climate change. So well done, Diana, and off we go. All right. Well done. I, 
I would uh, move that we adopt a resolution to adopt the Climate Ready Missoula Plan as an issue plan of the 2016 Missoula County Growth Policy. Second, finally. All We're in favor. On our way. Aye. We're good. Aye. Thanks, Anna. Thanks so much. Okay, we're just moving right along. Our next hearing is on the Smurfit Stone boundary line relocation and uh, live from his tower office is uh, Travis Ross. And, and uh, Travis Ross, and, uh, I, and I said that we're, we'll get mad on. Oh, thank Travis goodness, uh, I wasn't sure. Yeah, nervous there. So, so. <laughs> Travis can comment from his tower office. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, well, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, everyone, Matt Heimel here with Community Planning Services. So I'll present a uh, staff analysis for the Smurfit boundary line relocation. First, I'll just go over the location, general request, and some background information, and then I'll show more information about the proposed track layout and go over the um, uh, staff's uh, analysis of um, criteria for boundary line relocations. So I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen here momentarily. Okay, can everyone see the shared screen with the location map? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so this, uh, this boundary line relocation is a request from MLH Montana PA Prospect and David Wesley Harris to use the relocation of common boundaries exemption, the Montana Subdivision and Platting Act. And this is a division made outside of platted subdivisions for the purpose of relocating common boundaries between adjoining properties. And our county subdivision regulations uh, describe a relocation of common boundaries as a division of land that redesigns or rearranges the boundaries of tracts of record, but does not result in an increase in the total number of lots and or tracts. And so some background on the proposal. The request involves tracts uh, directly east of the Clark Fork River in the Grass Valley area. Sorry about the uh, dog growling, if anyone can hear that. Fairbanks Lane and Mullen Road provide access to the east portion of the property and one existing detached dwelling unit is located along the eastern edge of the property that is southwest of Fairbanks Lane. Um, an open cut mining operation is proposed for 130 bonded acres for which uh, community planning services has documented verification of the property is unzoned. So I'll move over to the um, this is the current lot configuration. And uh, so there's five tracks of record, which the relocation will reconfigure. Here's an overlay with the um, existing tract lines shown um, as these dash lines and the red showing the, the new boundaries. And here's the proposed track layout provided by WGM Group. And so the claimants represented by WGM Group propose to relocate the boundaries of five adjoining tracts of land that total approximately 395.32 acres. And the um, tracks will range in size from 2.3 to 162.8 acres. And the uh, so this property um, also should note it's located at the Smurfit Stone site west of Fairbanks Lane and Mullen Road. I'll go over a few comments that we received. Uh, one from the County Floodplain Administrator stating that it's reasonable not to require base uh, flood elevation determinations. And instead, um, if approved, we recommend uh, the Certificate of Survey include um, a recordation statement that states that development including but not limited to grading, filling, mining, storage, and construction of roads, utilities, and structures may not occur on the tract unless an engineered flood analysis has determined that the location of proposed development is located outside of a flood hazard area for those areas that are within the floodplain. And the uh, Water Quality District commented that the site is part of an ongoing investigation under EPA Superfund authority to evaluate risks associated with operations at Smurfit Stone. And this uh, proposal is within those boundaries and the DEQ 
And the, the Water Quality District has been reviewing information at a uh, scoping meeting for such an operation. We also received letters of comment from the Frenchtown Smurfit Stone Community Advisory Group and the Confederate Salish, um, uh, excuse me, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of the Flathead Nation, uh, expressing their interest in the project and requesting that a public hearing be, be held. And usually these requests for boundary land relocation outside of subdivision review would be handled administratively at a staff level. However, due to the public interest involved in the request we received on this project, uh, this was brought to the commission in early March and decided that a public hearing would be held on this um, proposal. So now I'll go over the um, evasion criteria, criteria review. So any subdivision exemption that comes into community planning services, whether it be a boundary line relocation, aggregation or family transfer is reviewed against a criteria for subdivision uh, evasion. And so in this um, proposal, a few of those uh, criteria were triggered. One being um, that four of the five lots created will be under 160 acres. Another that um, the applicants are, as stated in the application, are working to sell portions or develop uh, or redevelop these properties and that the claimants acquired the properties in December 2018 and 2019 and that criteria being that uh, the properties were acquired within the last two, two years. Also another criteria that we look at is how it fits with um, other tracks in the area. If it's a division that fits with the previously established a pattern of de development and the only aspect of that that we found this met was that the properties share access on Fairbanks Lane with the Nielsen addition that was platted in 2004. Matt, do you mind going over the second criteria? I, I want to make sure I understood that about development. Oh, sure. So one of the general evasion criteria is, is we look to see if the claimant is in the business of constructing or dividing, developing or selling land. And for this, we just quote the stated purpose of the application that claimants are working to sell portions or redevelop these, these properties. And, and and if if the claimant is in the business of redeveloping land that triggers this as a potential evasion criteria that that's correct we note it in our staff report that it it is something that can be analyzed in line with that criteria that that it but like we say it triggers it um, but which I'll uh, get to is that none of these items alone are necessarily together in small groups necessarily means that this constitutes an evasion of a uh, subdivision re of subdivision review. This is um, these are aspects on a case by case basis that that we'll look at and don't necessarily uh, mean that a, a proposal um, is, is an evasion. Thanks. OK. Uh, moving on, there is um, a criteria uh, looking at does the proposed um, division violate floodplain regulations or place properties within a flood hazard area and for this I again quote the uh, comment from the floodplain ad administrator that um, the application indicates that the pros tracks are not intended for residential use and will not be developed as such and any existing residential tract which may be within the floodplain uh, will continue with current use and according to the flood plan administrator, it's reasonable to not require base flood elevation determination and instead identify the FEMA designated floodplain on the certificate of survey if approved and include um, recordation uh, statements and the subdivision regulations that are pertinent to, to, this, to this item. Uh, the last evasion criteria that I'll touch on is we look to see if the division will result in a violation of federal, state or local regulations and for this we say that although no known violations of federal state or local regulations are evident the French town Smurfit Stone uh, citizens advisory group uh, submitted a comment letter indicating that this is this site is part of an ongoing investigation under EPA Superfund authority to evaluate the um, risk associated with operation at Smurfit Stone and so in staff's analysis and um, based on the facts as presented in the aff exemption affidavit and contained in our um, in our uh, re review of these items, 
there, there does not appear to be an attempt to evade subdivision review. And that is the uh, kind of the, the item that is at hand that, that we look at for these is do, does the proposed realignment of property boundaries of adjoining tracks um, constitute an attempt to evade subdivision review? So with that, uh, staff is recommending that the request to utilize the relocation of common boundaries exemption be approved. And the, um, I do believe the applicant's representative is also available for questions and I can take any questions as, as well on the, on the staff analysis. Thanks, is the applicant's representative available? Sure, hi Josh. This is Jamie Arbacher with WGM Group and I believe um, Kirk Adkins is on as well today. Yes, I'm um, here. <laughs> all right. Maybe if um, don't mind, I can do a quick screen share and just go over a couple additional points. Would that be all right? Certainly. Let me know what you're seeing there. Looking at your screen, I believe. MLH okay. prospect. Okay. All right. Um, are you seeing the slideshow presentation in, in slideshow presentation mode? Um, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A okay. colored map. Yep. Yep. OK, great. Um, so this here is representing um, the entire Smurfit Stone boundary, if you will. Um, the green indicates the property that MLH currently owns. Uh, red is what M2 Green currently owns. And then the other in blue is what has been sold off to other property owners, um, Steve Bidlake, um, another Lucher, and other um, various people, including PA Prospect, which is down here. Um, so this is the map provided by Newfields, shows the uh, operating units within the um, uh, EPA boundary. And so here we just wanted to represent that up in the northeast corner, you'll see where Lucia has acquired some property and some boundary line work has been done there in the past, notably in 2012 and 2015. Uh, Steve Bidlake, he received a piece of property on the east side. And in 2015, a boundary line relocation was approved. And all these have been filed as well, I should note. Um, again, Bid Lake down in the southeast corner, that piece was split off and a boundary line relocation approved. And then currently we have the PA Prospect property um, and PA Prospect does own all of the area hatched in purple right now. And then MLH Properties owns this larger tract that's hatched in red. Um, I did not show the Harris property just because it is so small, but it is in the northeast corner of the MLH property. Um, so this here is just another representation of the current parcel configuration. The parcels in red, those are currently owned by PA Prospect. Um, our understanding and what we're hearing is that the gravel pit proposal is within this boundary right here. Um, and then MLH, they currently own everything in the purple area here. So this here is the relocated boundaries. Red would be what uh, PA Prospect retains and the purple is what MLH would retain. Um, and MLH, the reason they're retaining these is really for a, a vegetative buffer, riparian buffer. Um, the well fields are actually located over here on track two. And so there is no development proposed in this area. Um, you know, again, this here is where we're hearing that the gravel pit may go, um, but really the gravel pit, if it if it happens or if not, it's going to undergo permit review, not only from floodplain, um, but DEQ. And so there is other processes that that would go through and that um, 
this process for a boundary line relocation. This boundary line relocation, we're not looking for approval for any type of use. We're just simp simply relocating the boundaries um, to address the owner's concerns um, for future ownership. Um, and then just here, since to focus in on the Harris piece of property, so you're aware of what's happening, um, this small triangular piece was transferred to the Harris's some time ago. However, back when it was in Smurfit's ownership, this larger area was fenced off and actually used by Harris. And so for over, oh, well, probably a good decade, it's been used by the Harris property and her family. And um, in 2012, there was actually a boundary line relocation that was approved here, but, or yeah, approved here, but it was never filed. Now we're just coming back and trying to fix this and actually um, <clears throat> transfer the ownership of the property that Harris currently uses to their ownership. Hey, Jamie, there is a field over, over I think, where you were. Can you show me that where, where you were talking about again? This one here? Uh, no, back to where you were. I just had a, a thing over my screen, so I couldn't see what you were talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, down here. Oh, there. Okay, I yep. see you now. Yep. Um, and so this here is just a summary of the concerns that we heard from um, the CAG Water Quality District and um, from the tribe. Um, you know, summarizing, we we know that this site is within the Spurfit Stone boundary and it's under investigation by the EPA Superfund Authority. Um, but again, we're not looking for approval or proposing any use with this relocation. Um, we know that PA Prospect, or I guess what we're hearing is that PA Prospect is um, applying for a zoning compliance permit for a gravel pit and also a scoping meeting with DEQ. Uh, we also know that DNRC is in the process of remapping the Clark Fork floodplain. Um, however, again, this will not affect um, any of that remapping process. And then also same with wildlife habitat. Um, this relocation won't affect any of that wildlife habitat. And then just for reference, here is a floodplain map. Um, the Clark Fork uh, floodplain is really this AE floodplain, the Little Val Creek floodplain, and the little fingers that are coming off of it, that's the zone A floodplain. And so that statement that we would place on the plat would say that if we were going to develop anything in this in this zone A floodplain, that we would have to go through a flood study, get a floodplain permit, basically follow those floodplain regulations, which we're absolutely fine um, placing that statement on the plat. So I'm available if you have any other questions or Kirk, you're out there. If you have anything else to add, please feel free. Yeah, I wouldn't mind adding a couple comments. Um, commissioners, good afternoon. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, this greater Smurfit Stone boundary that, that we showed on the one exhibit um, was obviously taken by EPA and, and I think it was new fields and they, they showed units on there. There it is. And, and so the yellow areas are what they were designating as agricultural. Um, and with our work on the property, we've done boundary locations in those agricultural areas to to move the land off to adjoining landowners and other Montanas that could, you know, utilize those areas. These were not the areas that were at all developed with the um, with the mill, and they were actually mostly used, I think, for grazing. Um, and now Lucia, I think, is growing alfalfa up there on the north. So, in the south here on the agricultural lands, um, PA Prospect is, has already bought that northern tier. And so they have an agreement with MLH to move these lines as part of that uh, purchase. So that's one aspect of this. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking about on this is that the tracks right now are large. I think the smallest one is 75 acres. And after the boundary relocation, these are the large tracks, I'm sorry. The Harrison is sort of a separate side item, but the larger tracks in the end, we end up, I think with the smallest one being um, around 75 acres also. So we're not moving any tracks to set up for development. We're just looking to realign the, the larger tracks and also relieve the encroachments 
on the Harris property. And that, that property actually was owned by Olson, who she passed away last year. And her parents were the Fairbanks, who sold all that southern area to uh, Waldorf Horner at the time, it's been many years ago. And when they held out property for their house, they, they didn't give much room. And so Smurf had actually fenced it much a much larger area out for them to use and that's what they've been occupying and using and so we're just trying to get that straight it's been in the works for well, almost 10 years to try to get that right and unfortunately virginia Olson won't be able to see that she was the one who really wanted it to be set right but her uh, son david wesley harris will be able to to um to to use that land or be be sure that now he has title to it is how i would put it um so in the end, the, the way I look at this boundary location is approving this is not approving anything for the future in terms of land use. This is just moving these larger track boundaries, the new configuration that works for the one of the two landowners and then also to uh, relieve the encroachments on that property. There the little uh, house and uh, sheds there for David Wesley Harris. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, Kirk, just for the record, I'm not sure if we were able to catch your last name as well, just because we're. Oh, I'm sorry. Kirk Adkins at WGM Group. I'm the lead land surveyor there. Thanks a lot. So, do we have any questions from the commissioners before we put this out to the public? Yeah, I have one question. Thanks, Jamie and Kirk. And uh, forgive me if I sound a little cynical, but. Uh, uh, history, uh, if it uh, indicates anything, is that what one sees is not always what one gets at the Smurfit site. So, uh, could you explain just a little bit more in terms of? Uh, I, I I understand the piece relative to encroachments and and boundary line relocations in those instances make a lot of sense, but. Um, do all the boundary lines that are proposing to be relocated need to be relocated to address the encroachment issue? For the encroachment, I think the only place there is is on the Harris property. And there are definitely sheds and a well. There's many improvements that are on the, the property owned by MOH Montana. There's the exhibit. So, yes, I mean, we're going to move out the outer outer boundary line goes along the six foot high chain link fence, which actually has barbed wire on top. And so it's going to match what's fenced out and how it's being occupied. Um, so I guess on the, uh, for instance, on the PA prospect parcel, uh, what, what could not happen in the future that could with a boundary line relocation or another another way to put it could they could they do their uh, open cut mine uh, without this boundary line relocation i mean i i think they could but they they have an agreement to move these lines and i think either way wherever the lines fall it it doesn't make it easier to do an open cut mine if that's what they're planning on doing. But they do have an agreement to move the boundary lines so the MLH retains the well field, the, the water line that moves the water or can move the water from those wells up to the main facility. And and then also sort of the riparian area or the, the buffer to the river. So that's why they've planned to move them in, in this way. So I guess my last question, um at this point at least would be how is it possible to um, have the agreement that you're referencing uh, that is predicated on a boundary line relocation when the boundary line relocation has not occurred yet right they've planned that um i guess contractually between the two landowners um i don't know if we, an attorney should speak to that part of it uh, that's true. I mean, the the plan is to 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 move the boundary lines, or that's what they agreed to. But obviously, it would have to be approved. Okay. Thanks, Kirk. Juan, do you have anything? 
Um, no, I was just asking if uh, we can see the, the proposed lines again. Okay, I, I, I'd love to hear from, um, yeah, Jerry or or Mary. Or, or Travis, if you have anything and to add to. Travis, too. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Um, I can I can go first. You know, we uh, so I, my name is Travis Ross. I'm with the Missoula Valley Water Quality District, which is part of of the Environmental Health Division, um, Health Department. So. We often um, see these boundary line relocations and provide comment from a, from a couple of angles. So first off, from a sanitation standpoint, it, it looks like these, these um, lots are exempt from sanitation review. Um, another I, thing I guess I would, I would bring up is um, learn from experience to share more information than less on, on this type of thing. So just, just wanted to get our um, our concerns on the record and our um, the the triggers or the the things that may cause problems down the road on the record. Um, not advocating for approval or denial. I'm sorry, but it, it, we just don't have a, have a, 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 a end all uh, recommendation on that. But um, I guess the the things that come to mind is now that we know that there, there is a, a, a proposed, or there's talk, there's been a, a, a scoping meeting on this gravel pit. Um, it's hard to separate that, that knowledge from the boundary line relocation. I just wanna acknowledge that. Um, and, and yes, there have been COSs filed elsewhere on the site. Um, the difference here is the gravel pit is a much more intensive use and has, and in my opinion, the ability to um, to affect groundwater and and one way or another. Um, the other couple of pieces of information is the the floodplain revisions are um, in the works, and given this is an intensive use, we also have a channel migration zone study um, that's being contracted right now. Um, that will provide more information um, going forward. But um, yeah, I think this also highlights the need of, of planning for, for this site and, and um, a vision and, and a thorough investigation at the same time. Um, you know, we're seeing these, these projects come up. Um, you know, there's the pyrolysis uh, issue that we've, or proposal that we've we've learned about too, and you know addressing these piecemeal is difficult, um, and then s complicating it with the BLR is is, uh, is also difficult. So um, our goal in submitting those comments is is just to get the get the information out there in front of the reviewer or in this case um, the commission. So um, those are the things. That's all I have. Looks like you're muted, Josh. Thanks, Dave. Jerry, do you Jerry, have any questions, sir? Um, actually, Bruce Sims has some questions that um, he wanted to address, so I'm going to go ahead and let him ask those questions. Great. Thanks. Right. Am I off mute now? You are. Just please introduce yourself for the record. Okay, certainly. I'm, I'm Bruce Sims and I'm a member of the uh, CAG administrative team and I'm also a retired hydrologist for the Forest Service. Um, I just had a, a couple of um, questions and, and one would be, you know, what Pre Travis had already mentioned, the, uh, the uh, potential for channel migration and, you know, that would likely be flood induced channel migration. And the second one would be, um, you know, the, sh the shallowness of the seasonal groundwater table there and, and um, the likelihood in my mind anyway, without actually studying it, that there'd be a high groundwater table and, and a filling of a pond where a gravel pit would form. And, and uh, you know, to continue to work the gravel pit would require some, some way of, 
um, pumping the water out of it. And you could actually form a new cone of depression, altering groundwater flow from the existing, existing directions, at least uh, at times. And so um, combining those two um, thoughts, you know, it could actually be, provide a, a flood flow route um, for channel migration um, you know, with a big pit in that location. You can, you know, you can look on Google Earth or these images and clearly see old meander uh, waves um, in the images. And so, you know, the river has been all over that that area in past times and there's a potential that it could happen again with, with a large enough magnitude flood. So those are my concerns in a nutshell and, and, and questions I think should be addressed. Hey Bruce, this is this is Juanita. Um, um, the, those concerns, right, would still be the case if there was no boundary line relocation. Like if That's there was correct. still a gravel pit there's still be channel migration. And so I'm struggling with, I feel like we're all kind of dancing around an elephant and I, I would just love for someone just to put it out there. What, what's, what's the real, what's the real concern? I get, this is Jerry. And I, I think that when we, the CAG, um, initially weighed in on this, we were just concerned that the site's an, part of an ongoing investigation um, to evaluate the risk, risks associated, and we're still in the process of evaluating those risks. Um, and I think that was generally the consensus of the group was that we just, we don't know what those risks are. Um, you know, we're, we're still in the, uh, the process. We haven't done any of the, we haven't had the second round of human health risk assessment to the fish tissue study that's um, the results have been out, but the data isn't, um, we haven't had a presentation, the BTAG hasn't met. It just, it, it just seems like um, those, the boundary line relocation is within the site operation of one of the affected parcels. And I, I did hear that the, um, application with DEQ was uh, approved or re uh, received and um, I'd have to go to their website but it looks like all the pieces and parts were in place for the gravel pit on that parcel. So Jerry I just want to be clear approved and received are really different. You know I'd have to go to the I'd have to ask Keith Large or um, Katie from DEQ and um, I had a very brief conversation with Colleen Owen and um, I don't know the answer and I I would think that somebody would be able to jump online and see that application. Josh, I, I believe Keith Large is on the line. Yeah. Oh, great, great. Let's, let's hear from Mr. Large. It looks like you're on mute. You're muted, Keith. Hmm. I believe Allie's also on. Um, I do see Allie too. Yeah. Is there a, well, we're waiting for Keith. John Hart, are you available for a moment? Yes, Josh, I'm available. Thank you, sir. So it's it's my understanding, given what our, our Matt Heimel presented to us, that this question of boundary line relocation is not one of use, but but a, a matter of potential for evasion of subdivision, which is proved or disproved by things like how many lots are actually created and the size of those lots and that sort of thing. And that the question of use isn't the question we're we should be considering today and and. and I fully get the concerns around a gravel pit and channel migration, and I share those concerns, but I am heartened that a gravel pit would have to go through a permitting process and any development would have to go through the floodplain process so that those aren't actually the issues that we should be looking at today. Um, but please tell me if I got that right or wrong. 
I think your analysis is correct, Josh. Thanks. So, so if, let me jump in here, Josh, if it's okay. So, uh, John, would the difference though be clearly some uses are going to be more intensive than others and potentially if a proposal if a lot configuration goes through subdivision review some impacts might be ascertained that otherwise would not be if it was just a simple boundary line relocation is that accurate that's also accurate a this the subdivision review under the statute and under our county regulations is a more comprehensive evaluation than is given to a boundary line relocation request. OK, thanks. Dave, can I just add a little bit there? This is Jamie Herbacher. Sure. Um, so even with the subdivision request, the property is still unzoned. And so um, the as Travis man mentioned, um, you know, there's no real planning out here. It's not zoned, uh, which means that the uses are a little more wide open, if you will. And so even if this goes through subdivision, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it would be restricted to one use or another. Um, those uses could change. Uh, uh, they be exempt from sanitation review because they're over 20 acres in size. Um, so th there's, a, there's a lot that goes into that, but I think what we get down to here is that um, we are not creating more parcels than what currently exists. So we're starting um, with the same number, we're ending with the same number, and um, the use of the battle pit, and it seems like the concern for everybody, that that use, that could occur as the boundaries are now. And so by changing these boundary lines, we're not um, enhancing that request or asking for anything additional if that um, gravel pit does happen. Now, when I, I get that, Jamie, I guess what I'm, I'm fishing around for a little bit and uh, or depending on the uh, the metaphor uh, hunting for uh, 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 elephants regarding is if 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 you could do exactly what if the if the same use could occur without a boundary line relocation then that obviates the need for it and, and like I mentioned earlier I get it in terms of the small area where there are encroachments but uh, but clearly there's there's a, an end game here that involves some some concrete use and um, and my concern would be might there be impacts associated with that that would be picked up through a more robust process than a boundary line relocation uh, Josh uh, while we're waiting for for Keith to uh, unmute uh, do you mind if I ask Allie Archer a question Archer, please, please, please. There, there's a question in the meeting chat too does that Gosh, do you want to ask that? Not even seeing that one. Thank you for catching it. Um, it's from Jen. Will the boundary line relocation impact accountability or enforceability of the ongoing Superfund investigation? And actually, that was a kind of exactly the question I was hoping to ask Allie uh, along the lines of how, if at all, might there be unintended consequences related to the remediation of the site? Allie, are you out there? This is Keith Large. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yep. But uh, Allie, are you there? No, Allie had to get off the phone at two thirty and go to a physical therapy appointment. Oh, okay. Because they're so busy trying to reschedule with COVID nineteen, she just couldn't miss the meeting. Um. She injured her leg on a trail run a while ago, so she's been going to physical therapy the last couple of weeks. So anyway, I'm glad you guys can hear me. I don't know what was going on. What I had to do is hang up my phone and call back in. My team's only works to see the video portion 
I can't hmm. use my computer to go to talk and listen, so I have to have two pieces of equipment on. Anyway, a couple of things. So all of this property is in operable unit one. Alpha Unit 1 has both of its risk assessments are completed. Those risk assessments don't show any risk to human health and the environment. We're waiting on risk assessments for OU 2 and 3. Another thing to point out is that the gravel pit application has been sent to DEQ and whoever mentioned earlier, it's been submitted, but as far as I know, it has not been approved. There is a huge difference. So the open cut program, Katie Garzen, Forba, and Colleen uh, Owens are working on that. I'm not sure where they're at. I gave some information to Jerry to contact them earlier this week. I think she's in the process of trying to talk to them and find out where they're at. Now, the application states that they will not dig down into the groundwater for the gravel pit. Um, the EPA comfort letter to PA prospects went out, and it also says that they cannot, you know, go down and dig into the groundwater. If they do, then EPA has to reevaluate their operation. And in other words, like their comfort letter would be. I guess basically become void if they dig into the into the groundwater. Um, but I think the more important thing is um, it's all inside the Superfund boundary, and we're not going to change the Superfund boundary until the entire remedial investigation is completed, and that's still a year or two away, probably. Hopefully, more like a year, not two years, but uh, the reason I say that is because there was already a letter sent to uh, M2 Green requesting that OU1 be taken out of the Superfund boundary, and EPA Alley's attorney wrote back to them and told them we can't do that until the RI is completed. It has to do with certain language in the AOC. So when the RI is complete and final, all the other risk assessments are done for OU2 and 3 everything like that, um, then it may be possible that the OU1, the areas in yellow and on that map on the screen, all those Lucia properties, Bedlick, the PA prospect and the MLH could possibly come out of the Superfund site, but not right now. Um, as far as the question of the boundary line stuff, um, I don't know. I think it's more, that's the information that Allie and I have for you guys for this meeting. So, unless you have further questions. Well, maybe could, could I see Anna Connolly is on. Would she be able to answer Jen's question? Hi, Juanita. Can you remind me what Jen's question is? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, will the boundary line relocation impact accountability or enforceability of the ongoing Superfund investigation? Which I guess is yeah. Jerry's question too. Yeah, the Not answer is no. Well, yeah, the answer hey, is no. Hang on, hang on, Keith. Uh, we got uh, our attorney oh. responding. Yeah, this is Anna Conley with the County Attorney's Office. Um, I've spoken with Ali Archer about this site and about this process. My understanding is that moving these parcels will not impact the EPA's analysis of this site or their remedial options on the site. And I would concur with that. With EPA is going to maintain their authority until whenever they change their boundary. So it has no bearing on what you guys decide today or if you decide whatever you decide. That's so I just want to throw something out here to really for Dave and Juan is that my concern here is that we're drifting into a larger conversation about use and and right. that actually the question before us isn't isn't about use and and of course this question of use is absolutely compelling given what this site is the the absolute change in river dynamics the floodplain the 
everything about this very hot button place screams out. And yet that's not what we're talking about or supposed to be talking about. I, I believe my sense is we're just supposed to make sure that there's the same number of lots after the adjustment as beginning and there isn't an obvious obviously not doing this in order to sell something off where they should have been going through subdivision review and i'm just nervous that if we drift too far into use we will uh open ourselves up uh, in ways make ourselves vulnerable in ways that we probably should that's just my two cents well i i'll, I'll offer a little bit uh different perspective there and uh and, and maybe we yeah, I think it's a point well taken that uh, that there's some decision space here that may not be uh, fully um, fully satisfactory to uh, many folks on the line here today uh, that are focused more firmly on use. But I guess the exception to that would be take, for instance, uh, another subdivision exemption that we're all familiar with the uh, the much beloved um, family transfer and uh, and there was one recently that we we took a look look at out by nine mile and um, where use and this was one where someone was proposing a commercial uh, operation uh, guest ranch if you will on one of the parcels that would be created Admittedly, uh, it's a diff bit of a different scenario in that it that that's creating additional parcels or lots um, as opposed to what we're contemplating here, which is just reconfiguring lot lines. But nonetheless, the the the, the analogy, I guess, is that in both cases, based on how lot lines are drawn on a map, uh, uh, will either um, uh, facilitate or not certain uses that might undergo um, um, more scrutiny during a full-blown subdivision review and so yeah it's it's not it's not exactly uh, um, evaluating the use per se but but certainly what how you draw the lines on a map can uh, uh, um, create opportunity for uses that might not be fully analyzed as much as we would like in this sort of process. And so Dave, keep keep going with that if. Well, and that's what I'm getting at here is is this is the maybe the elephant that uh, the elusive elephant that may or may not <laughs> materialize today is uh, uh, apart from what I, I totally get is rearranging the lot lines to uh, accommodate uh, uh, encroachments on the landscape out there. It's not entirely transparent to me what the end game is with um, uh, reconfiguring the rest of these lot lines. And if we were to know up front how this lot line reconfiguration would facilitate certain uses, how would how at all would uh, would this process look different or, or reveal different outcomes if we went through a subdivision review process versus uh, the uh, boundary line boundary. relocations? So the, the, the future uses that folks are most concerned about, I mean, they would still undergo what we're hearing or what I think I'm hearing is that they're still going to undergo the scrutiny and the um the rigor that whether it's a gravel pit or or channel migration um they're still going to be addressed or are the, you saying the, that it's well, not for the, well for the gravel pit perhaps but it's still uh, a bit of a mystery to me what uh what these other line configurations or uh, uh relocations will will yield uh, so you think about what we typically would evaluate during a, a subdivision review process, all the criteria, and, and that can range from transportation impacts to uh, environmental impacts. I'm just uh, um, I'm just very wary that there could be unintended consequences of what we're contemplating here. Maybe not, but we've seen this happen elsewhere. But 
But Dave, then again, the question, the question that is before us isn't about future uses or even unintended consequences. Well, it, I think it ought to be. Um, I mean, it, <laughs> it, if we were to just wipe the slate clean, no boundary lines here being relocated at all, but uh, rather a straight up subdivision proposal, uh, there would be a whole range of impacts being analyzed by the creation of the division of land. And so my question similarly is, and maybe the answer is no, but might there be some uh, uh, impacts that would accrue by virtue of how these particular lot lines are being placed on the map uh, versus how they are uh, currently? Sorry, Josh, you were going to say something. Uh, um, thanks, Juan. Dave, I, in some sense, I'm with you, and I, I, I'm absolutely certain that uh, there's an answer to this mystery and that the parties in question are not telling us. And they're not telling us because for a boundary line relocation, they don't have to. Uh, who knows what they're contemplating here beyond the gravel pit, and I'm, I'm, I bet the developer's representatives don't even know. But for the matter at hand, this boundary line relocation, the key pieces to this are the same number of parcels, is the number of parcels remain consistent pre and post location or uh, relocation and are the sizes uh, appropriate so they can cont continue on here uh, regardless of use and uh, I'm, I'm just nervous that, i'm nervous that we're going to get this wrong yeah well, anna please um, i think this is anna <laughs> I, um, I was just wondering if i could make a recommendation and that's if potentially caps could talk about what would be analyzed here under subdivision review that's not being analyzed here under BLR and what analysis went into their determination that you're not uh, that the developers aren't trying to evade subdivision review. Thanks. Yeah, go for it, Matt. OK, I think I'm unmuted now. So for subdivision review, um, some of the criteria that we look like that we look at in subdivision review for our for a significant adverse impacts on properties such as impacts on uh, agriculture, natural environment, um, wildlife, um, public health services, and without uh, speculating on what those impacts would be, it's likely that conditions may be imposed uh, relative to a subdivision's um, impact on those items, and so second part regarding our uh, analysis that went into concluding that it was not evading subdivision review i'll touch on what's already been mentioned that in the uh, general evasion criteria and rebuttable presumptions that are in the uh, that, that are in, in the analysis we didn't see that there was evidence pointing to uh, a development pattern or a um or um in, or a purpose that is contrary to what is stated in the exemption affidavit that that would lead to then those evasion criteria collectively pointed to yes it's, it's an it's an evasion so that's why we um recommended that this does fall under a a valid uh boundary line re relocation applicable as as a uh, exemption from the montana subdivision and planning act are there any other uh, questions about the the staff analysis or it might go into a subdivision review could, could I interject for a minute? This is Kirk Adkins from WGM Group. Um, Dave is talking about the the layout of those new tracks, and um, I kind of went through that. If maybe Jamie, you could move to that slide. Um, there's a well field that's on track two, and and that has a lot of value. Plus a water line that's running up to the main facility, and MLH owns. The property to the north there which is left on the screen and so they're trying to keep that asset with the rest of the property and so that is why it's in that configuration it's kind of following that slew also but they're trying to keep that with the rest of their ownership so it's pretty straightforward why it's in that location um that's that's the reason and it connects to their owning you know their ownership to the north thanks Thanks, Kirk. So, Kirk, this is Jerry. Um, MLH is uh, 
Wakefield Kennedy, am I wrong? That's, well, I, they're connected with them. I'm not sure how the exact subsidiary or how that's set up, but yeah, Wakefield. So they're eventually, because of the foreclosure, going to be an owner of the entire site, it's my understanding. I'm not sure if I can comment to that. I'm not, I don't know the, the ins and out details of, of that part of the thing. Yeah. I mean, I would say I haven't heard a clear plan of what they're going to do. And I, and that seems like really the, the elephant in the room is like, what's going to happen here? And I'm not yeah. sure that it's, it's sorted out. But I think the way this line is being drawn is trying to, like I said, help collect the assets on the property they still own. And, and that plan can be is up for development and, and thought as we go mm -hmm. forward. So mm -hmm. that's what I know. Hey, Josh, this yes, is Dave. Uh, and there might be other folks who want to comment also, but uh, yeah. just a procedural question maybe for John Hart would be, are there any statutory deadlines associated with this question that's before us today uh, in the event that uh, there are any unanswered questions that we feel like we need to work on beyond today's public hearing? Not that I'm aware of, no. There are no there are no deadlines in the Montana Subdivision and Platting Act, and I don't believe that our subdivision regulations uh, require the commission to make a decision under these circumstances with any with within any specific amount of time. Okay. Thanks. Jamie, are there other deadlines that you're working with? Um, Kirk would know as far as the with the owners if there's deadlines and what those may be. But none that I'm aware of in the subdivision regulations or the exemption section. OK, so J Jerry and Mary, if, if, if this boundary line relocation is approved what what does that do for you this is mary prices was that question directed towards me yes yes mary okay or All jerry right. <laughs> okay thank you very much um well, I just want to offer a couple observations. I've been listening really intently to the discussion between Commissioner Slotnick and Strohmeyer, and I found it really illuminating. And that's part of the reason that the tribes requested this hearing. It's to better understand what the um, unintended consequences of this boundary line relocation might be. And I just would like to offer a couple of observations. Um, from the tribe's perspective, and then based on this discussion, you know, we're hearing there's all these different regulations and review processes that we're hearing about. There would be DEQs, Missoula counties, and then EPA Superfund process. And the concern from the tribes is that while they're all addressing their own areas of interest, our concern is that something may slip through the cracks unintentionally. And while it is true that EPA, uh, that this boundary line relocation is uh, located in operable unit one, and it's correct that EPA has completed a risk assessment and found there's no risk, EPA has also identified site-wide groundwater as part of operable unit three. So to me, this issue really rests on the groundwater question um, out there. If there's, if the future use is going to be a gravel operation, then there's definitely potential there for groundwater impacts. And we simply don't know enough about the groundwater situation out there to understand what that might mean for the release of toxins into the Clark Fork River. I mean, we know that there are toxins, or excuse me, contaminants being released through the groundwater pathway. And an important piece of information that we're waiting on from EPA 
is a conceptual site model for groundwater, and that is forthcoming very soon. And I understand that this question before you today is addresses a boundary line relocation rather than future use. But again, getting back to the fact that we have all these different regulations that deal with their own areas, and yet we have this groundwater issue out there on the site and we're waiting for the groundwater conceptual site model. It just seems like this is an important piece of information that really, if, if this can be considered if they're more carefully, I think we need to understand it better. And also the channel migration zone study that Travis referred to, another very important piece of information. And we just don't know enough yet. And we could end up in a place that maybe we all don't want to be at at some point. This is such a unique property, four miles of the Clark Fork River. Um, I'm just hoping that all the parties can come together and and uh, maybe engage in some land use planning as Travis was talking about it. It just seems like such an incredible opportunity to the to Missoula, to the river, and um, it's just so unique given the Superfund status of the site and the whole history of the site. So um, thank you commissioners for having this hearing today. Um, it's, it's been really helpful. Thanks for saying all that, Mary. Um, and I, I agree with you in that if we could look at this area as a blank slate, it's a tremendous planning opportunity. And oh, unfortunately, that's not the slate we have before us. These folks have applied for a boundary line relocation. And what I'm what I'd be considering right now is to kind of call a timeout and allow us uh, at, at least this is the, my, my own personal concern to the opportunity to chat more in depth wise with our attorneys. My, my concern is that if we deny this based on the potential dangers of future uses, we will have colored outside the lines of the law, which say which don't mention future use in the description of why a boundary line readjustment adjustment should be approved or not approved. But I really don't want to make a mistake. And this is a a gem of a piece of land that is has incredible value in all sorts of different ways and I'm quite nervous about getting it wrong. Uh, so I wonder if we could just ask for some time. Mary, when did you say those analysis would be uh, conduct or available? What's, what's the timeline there? Um, it's, it's a matter of a few months. I'm sorry, I don't have the EPA schedule right in front of me, but uh, at the last update from Ellie Archer, um, it was in a, a matter of a few months. So, uh, so for at least for my mind, Mary, I, I, I get all that, but that isn't the piece that I'm speaking to. What I wouldn't, what, what I'm asking for is not to wait a few months till future analysis are done, but for wait a, a little bit of time so we could talk with our attorneys to find out if we are or are not actually going astray of the law by contemplating not approving this boundary line relocation based on future use, not based on what it actually a boundary line relocation is. That's the piece, at least just, I'm only speaking for myself. That's the part I need some time on, not not the let's do more analysis on the site. But well, maybe I'm it's a little open to hearing both you guys, so I don't mean, to, I'm not trying to speak for anybody but me. No, I, I think it would be prudent, Josh, to uh, not make a decision today. And so what I would be interested in in thinking through a little bit more in depth would be exactly what you've said in terms of what is our what is our decision space what sort of findings of fact or conclusions of law would we need to um, in a case like a boundary line relocation support whatever decision we make and i, I guess i'd also um, like to hear a bit more from travis at some point in terms of what uh what a floodplain or channel migration analysis and the results from that would yield that that would have would be germane to a boundary line relocation decision. May, maybe not at all, but I don't feel like we're going to necessarily uh, uh, unless unless we just do it in a kind of a hurried fashion, figure that out today.
What do you think, Ron? <clears throat> oh, I was waiting for Travis. Oh, sorry. I'm I'm right. I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> that, that there are really two. I guess two questions. One is more of a, a legal analysis, but um, but certainly we would know something by the end of July beginning of August about channel migration zone through here. Um, what's that, what that's anticipated to be, but that information and its effect on um, the BLR decision, I don't know that. And I guess that's what I would be interested in, just taking some more time to think through because uh, if, it, it does us no good to simply delay a few months for the results of those studies to come back and, and then realize that, well, it doesn't make any difference really in terms of the boundary line relocation decision what the results of those are. But uh, if they did, uh, if, if that would be germane to our decision at hand, I would like to at least know that sooner rather than later. So now, now there's a plane flying overhead. <laughs> it's kind of loud. I, I would I would propose we kind of call time out for a little bit specifically to huddle up with our legal folks to make sure we have the proper parameters on the decision space really putting aside the ecological considerations and if indeed those ecological considerations can come into play then we maybe we wait longer until we get those answers but in the short term let's do uh, I, my proposal is let's do a delay so we can find out the specific legal parameters within which we can make a decision. And if ecological considerations are in, in those parameters, then maybe we wait longer. And if not, then we figure out how to schedule a decision. Is there any? Gosh, this, is this is Larry Leakes. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Sir. Oh, OK. Uh, I'd like to make a comment regarding uh, wildlife habitat out there. And I worked at the mill for 32 years, and then after I retired, I worked on habitat restoration. And the area on the south end of the property that we're talking about, it's about 50 acres. It includes Laval Slough and Laval Creek. And I feel that that should be part of the riparian uh, zone that's owned by MLH. And so, I would propose that the boundary line between track one and track two, as it goes south, go east up to the boundary, up to the uh, uh, east boundary of the mill property. Currently, it goes west to the river. And so all of that slough is not included in the in a MLH property as a buff, boundary riparian buffer and uh, that area is in the floodplain and I feel it should be included in the riparian buffer zone. It also includes a deep well which was a surprise to me because they obviously want to retain ownership of the well field which includes eight wells in track two but they didn't include the ninth well which is in track one. And to me, that south portion, that 50 acres on the south end of the property, should be in the riparian buffer zone. Thanks, Mr. Weeks. Did, did you get all that? We did. So, Juan, Juan okay. Dave, what do you think about a, a, a timeout for a couple of weeks? Uh, um, John yeah, and Anna, if, yeah, we, are yeah. we in trouble if we ask for a timeout for two weeks? No, this, you're not in trouble, Juan. You, you can do that, but I would encourage you to make sure that you've taken all the public comment um, that is on the line and wanting to comment today um, before you entertain that uh, continuance. So, Thanks. Br Brian, is, does have anybody have Brian? any more public comment? Okay, seeing seeing none. Uh, John, do we need to? What's the process on on doing a two week timeout? 
Well, why don't you ask Emmy if there's availability on an upcoming um, Thursday afternoon public meeting two weeks or farther out, and then one of you can, um, you know, just move to, uh, we can, <clears throat> I forget the term too, um, to um, continue this hearing until that date. Right. We'll keep this hearing open. And so the, what's our schedule look like? And, uh, two weeks, uh, so that'd be June 11th, and there is a hearing that day, and it's open. So if you want to do that, we can do that. Thanks. Great. Sure. Dave, you want to make that motion since this was yeah, your idea? <laughs> yeah, I would uh, move that we continue the public hearing until, uh, what was the date again? I'm sorry. June 11th. June 11th. Yeah. June 11th. Second. All right. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thanks for the good Josh, discussion. Josh, yes, before we, we leave uh, the topic, I did see John DeArmond on the line from Clark Fork Coalition. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, if they have any uh, thoughts on the matter right now. Hi, this is John from the Clark Fork Coalition. Thanks, Dave. Uh, nothing in addition to what we heard from Mary and the CAG and from Travis. I thought they covered it pretty well from our perspective, but I appreciate you checking with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good, good catch, Dave. Thanks, John. Okay, well, I look forward to learning more over the next two weeks, and uh, we'll take this up on June 11th. Do we have any other business? All right, then with that, we will be adjourned and thank you all for taking the time to